I think of all, all the ongoing relationships and professional and friendship relationships with James Coburn is, is on the top of the list. They first worked together on Major Dundee, and then after Major Dundee, Sam hired Jimmy to play um, Pat Garrett in Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid with uh, Chris Christopherson. After Pat Garrett um, was one of the most important films that uh, Sam did with him was Cross of Iron, which was an amazing film about the German soldier on the Russian front, which I, I think changed the face of war films. In fact, um, Orson Welles said that Cross of Iron was the greatest anti-war film of all time. And that experience um, was one that I will never forget, and I, for me was the greatest film that I worked with them both on. And then at the end, Convoy, which is which um, um, Sam hired Jimmy to be the, assist, the second unit director. So y Jimmy and I were working as second unit directors. I was in the truck with a camera. Jimmy was in a in a in a water water station that down the road. Uh, uh, waiting for the trucks to come by, which was uh, 170 of them. So Jimmy and I worked together as assistant, as a second unit directors on Convoy. So your first real solid work experience with Sam was on Major Dundee. I'd like to hear a little bit about that and the fact too that you had perhaps you wanted some notes about the character and how you managed to achieve that. Well, on Major Dundee, uh, it was the first time that I'd worked with Sam. I had met him and we'd we'd had conversation. I had had a bit of a relationship, but not really anything very deep. And. Uh, I was constantly trying to find out from Sam just what this character was, where the base of, the basis of the character was, what, what, I could, what I could hang on to. You know, an, an actor needs some, some kind of <laughs> uh, a base to work from. And uh, I kept saying, Sam, Sam, what, uh, what is it about this guy? This, he's just an Indian scout. What, uh, but I don't know anything about him. He said, Dryer. He doesn't give a shit. I thought, dryer? What's dryer? Well, it was a very it was a very interesting comment because it was it was what he wanted to have happen from the character. A very dry, very uh, kind of uh, enigmatic character who he, he didn't really know which side he was on. It, it, very dry, and he doesn't care about anything. Well, I found it really difficult to find, you know, like what... So it was kind of a vocal thing, dry, very dry. So I made him very dry, like he was always wanting to drink. So wanting to drink means that he was always a little bit out of it. He always liked to have a little bit of a hit here and a little bit there. He was always very dry. So as a, uh, as a director, Sam was always looking for something that was real coming out of a, an enigmatic character. He never wanted the character to be perfect. He always wanted the character to be a little bit off balance, a little bit, a little bit here and a little bit there. So he, he had he had a dynamic that he could squeeze in and out, so that it had it would go someplace. So it wasn't perfect right down the line, and every, all the lines were being said perfect. He was he was always throwing you off balance one way or the other. And it was marvelous to work with. I mean, that kind of a director is great to work with because it's never perfect. You don't do the perfect thing. You're looking for that accident, that divine accident, that thing that happens when you don't know what's going to happen. So, I mean, and, and for me, that was uh, it was an interesting challenge. <laughs> Dreyer, he doesn't give a shit. What do you mean by that, Sam? I mean, stop, don't talk about it. He wouldn't talk about the character, and very rarely did talk about the character to anybody. Do you think this uh, method of disconcerting actors threw them back on themselves to find something within their own personality that they could play? What it did is bring you right up to the moment. Oftentimes, he would do it right on, on camera. He would say, say that line again. Say that line again, God damn it. Or he'd say it with an attitude that would, call, that would arouse in you some kind of a, 
a, a reaction, and, and you would say the line again, it would come out entirely different. You, then you'd have to justify it as you were going along. And it would change the whole thing. And that's what he wanted. He didn't want to know. He didn't want you to know what was going to happen. That's what made him very interesting to work with. I love that. I Do you think he knew, or what he was exploring as well? He was exploring as well, absolutely. He wanted to find out what the truth of that scene was. He didn't want to invent, he didn't want to invent the truth and say, Do this. He wanted to let it happen. And then say, ah, that's got it. And he would know when he had it. I mean, he would shoot sometimes with three and four cameras and... Uh, say that line again, damn it. Or, say it again. You know what I mean? Say it again. And he would give you a, a, a kind of uh, vocal inflection of, 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 of where the dynamic should be. It was far out. It was interesting. And, uh, but on camera, when you're doing it, it would, it would arouse in you kind of... What's he mean? I mean, why doesn't he cut and say, yeah, let's, let's do it again? But no, he would keep it on. And that's what, <laughs> you'd have to do it on camera. So there's a lot of reactions I'm sure that he got that he used. I don't know, you can talk to Katie about that because <laughs> she was there all the time. As a, a group, as a bunch of actors um, operating like this, it must have made sometimes for a rather uneasy atmosphere on set. <sighs> well, Sam used to create an uneasy atmosphere. I mean, uh, uh, he'd create an atmosphere that was perfect to work in. He created, I mean, the, the, the set directors would go crazy, absolutely crazy, because Sam would come in and nothing would be right. And they would have to do it really in a hurry, you know, and it'd be really messy, and especially in the westerns and things. When it was too perfect or it looked phony or something, he would really funk it down, really make it look bad, really make it look like it had been there for 400 years. So he created an atmosphere, and then he placed the actors in this atmosphere. And within that atmosphere, within the atmosphere of, of work, it all seemed to come together. I mean, it, I mean, when you're working in Durango, Mexico, which is the worst place in the world, I mean, I'll never go back to Mexico again. Sam really turned me off Mexico. But anyway, in this thing, it, there's a, this thing that uh, the characters would have. He would have this, not love of Mexico, but love of this dirty, uh, this, this, where there's 4,000 years of horse manure floating around in the air that makes you feel like you're sick half the time. And, you, it's, and Well, this was the atmosphere that he would create, and he would allow that to happen, and he would bring that on, on film. And that's why a lot of his films look so strange and so you know, weird, off balance. And I don't know. It, uh, the actors themselves, I mean, I, I mean Chris Christopherson, for instance, well, <laughs> in... In Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, when R.G. Armstrong attacks him, was uh, it was true terror because R.G. came at him with his, by God, this, and he came up with a shotgun and he was going to kill this guy. And it scared, it really scared Chris. And Sam was really happy with that. I mean, he really got that when boy. He was really pleased with that. But it was real, it was real. He went for the truth, and he didn't know what the truth was until he saw it. Your next experience, I think, was Pat Garrett. Pat Garrett, Billy the Kid, yeah. Uh, there was there's something about, we were talking about the deconstruction of the script and then reassembling it in his own form or image. Can you talk a bit about that? Well, the, uh, the script was written, Pat Garrett, Billy the, Billy, Billy the Kid's script was written by uh, a beautiful writer, Rudy Wurlitzer. Uh, we both read the script and fell in love with it because it was a perfect script. It was poetic. It had the characters down pat, and it was enigmatic and beautiful. And there was a particular scene in it that we both caught into. It was a, a scene on the river where I was, way, I was going after, as, as Pat Garrett, I was uh, kind of trying to give Billy the Kid, uh, uh, who was an old friend of mine, a, uh, a leeway to get back to Mexico. I told him, get out of the country, get out of the... So I'm going, making a big circle around. Well, this scene was a metaphor for the whole piece. It was a, a raft with a, a man who, on the thing shooting a bottle. His kid was being, uh, kids, and there were three or four kids on the thing, and a, his wife, and it was floating down the stream. And uh, they'd throw the bottle out there, and he was shooting a bottle in the, uh, in the water as it floating down the stream. And I, bang, I heard this thing. I was, I was just sitting resting by a tree. And, uh, uh, 
we shot this, uh, I, the, the, the bottle was in, I see this raft floating down, this guy's shooting. And so I take my rifle out and I make a shot. And he looks up at me and he shoots at me and I get behind the tree and I shoot at him. And he shoots back at me and then, and then we both look at each other and he's floating down the river. And then he shoots at the bottle and we just let it go. And it's a beautiful, I mean, because of that scene, we both wanted to do the film. Well, as we started uh, doing the film, uh, Sam's, Sam's desire to make a movie, not shoot a script, has always confused and confounded producers. They've always liked to have, oh, it's a perfect script, let's just shoot the script and you know, we can do that in 20 days or 100 days or whatever. But Sam doesn't work that way. Sam worked in a very, he made a film. He didn't shoot a script. And so the script would be, you know, like taken and uh, used as a, as kind of like the, the, the premise for the movie. And Rudy was uh, naturally disconcerted about this because as a writer, as most writers are, they're very concerned with their words and their, the, uh, the, the evolution of that into a film. But it's not all in the words, it's in the actual doing of the thing. And uh, we're, he, he, he would, invite his old friends down and create a scene here, let's do this and you say that, you know, in the middle of this beautiful script that Rudy had written. And it put Rudy off quite a bit. But that was, that was the nature of Sam and his filmmaking. He would make a movie, he wouldn't shoot a script. And thank God for that, and I think that uh, most real filmmakers do that. You can't shoot a script. I mean, writers don't understand that it's necessary to destroy the script in order to make a movie. The script has to be totally discarded, as every actor's performance has to be discarded. It's discarded in the editing. You know, because I, I, oftentimes you find all of your justification, a scene that, where you've justified yourself and everything, is totally missing from the film, and ah, you find yourself... This. But that's the nature of it. As long as you, if you've written the script, okay, then your job is done. Now the movie has to be made. And if you acted your part, then that's your, your job is finished because that's what your job is while the film is shooting. Uh, I loved, uh, I love Sam for that because he made, he evolved something. It was a metamorphosis of a, of a script. You turn, turned it into a butterfly. It just wasn't in a cocoon after that. It was something more. You became more because you worked on it. Sam always gave medals away, did you know that? I'm sure you've, you've heard about all the medals we got. I, the, for Cross of Iron, I've got this big golden cross. <laughs> Bobby Basiglia probably has more than anybody. Talking about uh, missing scenes, I mean, in fact, Pat Garrett, in its first release version, cut out the flashbacks which explained your character. Yeah, cut that out, cut out some scenes with my wife too i think i don't even think that they were in the uh, revised version there is a version somewhere somewhere that has the uh, the scenes with with my wife in it because the idea of the circular journey if you don't have those things to explain becomes <clears throat> rather uh, not self-defeating but uh, unclear yeah. yeah yeah i know but they, they were they were going for a different thing uh, Jim Aubrey and uh, Melnick and uh, all of those guys at uh, MGM at that time. I told Sam, I said, listen, I just finished doing a film with, uh, at, uh, with Blake Edwards at MGM with Jim Aubrey in charge. And uh, I said, Sam, are you sure you want to make this film with MGM? Because, you know, they, they really do bad things. They cut 18 days out of our film. And, uh, you know, because we were ahead, they cut it out. And they told us we had to finish it. He said, don't worry about a thing. I just bought one share of MGM stock. And if anything happens, I'll sue him. <laughs> he was very naive on many levels, as you can see, too. That was really funny. One share of MGM stock, and he was going to kill him. <laughs> Can I talk a bit about Sir Garrett and Billy? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> because there's a most extraordinary moment at the end after you've killed Billy where you shoot your own reflection. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me how that came about? Well, as we were setting the shot up, there was a, uh, this mirror, a great mirror standing there. And uh, I shoot Billy and I, I, I looked over there and I saw the thing and I said, Sam, look, look at this. Look at, look at it. I mean, it was just one of those things that happened on, on the set. I, I said, what if I just shoot myself in the mirror? He said, no, 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 no. I said, come on, Sam. Look at the, 
look at what it means, look at this. You know, and he knew what it meant all along. He hesitated and he didn't want to do it. And it, was, it wasn't until really late in the scene, after we'd shot the scene, and said, come on, Sam, let's just shoot this. Let's, let's shoot it like that. And he says, okay. And we shot it, I guess, four or five times. He really went for it. So uh, that's how that came about. I, I, I was, uh, see, with Sam, if, if, if uh, he was always open to ideas and things. You'd have to present it in kind of a bass awkward way sometimes because if it was what you wanted, you'd have to present it like something you didn't want and then he would say, okay, let's do it that way. So he'd reverse the thing. So sometimes you'd have to do it that way, but this, this way would, was pretty direct. And it was nice. I, I thought it had a nice feeling at the end because that's what it, I wanted Pat Garrett to feel at that time, that he just, he'd just killed a piece of himself at least an image of himself that was uh, was not perfect, and it was something that he uh, tragically felt in him about his idea. Sam also said, he said, why do we have to kill Billy the Kid? I said, well, he said, why don't we make him live? Why don't we let him live? I said, Sam, that's, that, that's not the way it goes. That's, he said, let's create a new myth. That was Sam, let's create a new myth. And he would have gone for it. He would have said, okay, let's, you know, if we could have figured it out somehow, but that was, you know, not to be had, but let's create a new myth. I loved him for that phrase. Of course, uh, he has a scene with you shortly before. Yeah, 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 right. So in fact, and in fact, he urges you on to do the deed. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit about that? Well, as I recall, it was just kind of almost... He was saying, who's going to play the casket maker? And he says, I got it. I think I'll play it. I'm going to play the casket maker. You think you can handle that? <clears throat> and uh, when I offered him a drink, and he says, no. You know, I almost broke up in the scene. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, it was, it was a bit disconcerting playing with Sam in that scene because he... Uh, I had the tendency, I, what, I, I, what I wanted to do was say, say that line again. Say that line again, damn it. And because he, you know, he kind of mumbled through some things, you know, he didn't, you know, he was kind of improvising the lines. He wasn't, it wasn't ever written. And uh, it was just really kind of an obs uh, I don't know what he was, I really don't know what he was trying for there, what, what the reason was that he wanted to play the, the casket maker. But it was far out, it was fun. I mean, I, I, I really can't help you out there. It's, uh... I wish I could tell you. He got you to do it, though, as a character. Sure, oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely, yeah. He pushed you into the act. Okay. Oh, yeah. No, he was, I mean, he was really angry at me. I mean, the way that he played the thing was, I mean, you really, you son of a bitch. You know, I think he, he was yelling at me. He wasn't yelling at me, but he was, he was cursing me. And he said, why don't you go on, get in there. Why don't you go ahead and do it, Garrett? You know, like <laughs> then his... Uh... He had perhaps sympathy for your part, but maybe he was in love with Billy. You yeah, no. Billy was the one he was in love with. Yeah. As far as Garrett goes, you know, he, he didn't, you know, he felt the tragedy of Garrett. He felt the, the, but he didn't like Garrett. He liked Billy because Billy was this total rebel who, you know, like who was tragically murdered, murdered by this guy. Demons. I don't necessarily want to know what they were unless you would want to speculate about that, but how he coped with that and how he operated with this inner conflict. Well, I don't know what Sam's personal demons were. I mean, of course, we could, ex we could speculate on them from time immemorial and never really know. And I, I don't think they're really important anyway, because uh, for an artist as, uh, with as much dynamic as Sam had, it's, uh, it's sometimes necessary to have those demons there, as they're called. Maybe they're muses as well. But the muse can also be a demon. I mean, it can make you do a lot of things that... Uh, other people don't want you to do. But Sam's, Sam was always, uh, 
I mean, it, when he got a film, he would prepare it, prepare it, prepare it, prepare it, until somebody said, all right, you've got to start shooting. You've got to start it, Sam. And he would, uh, Nick, uh, he would delay that as long as he could, and finally he had to start shooting. Well, then he would shoot as long as he possibly could until somebody said, that's it, you've got to stop today. And, that's, uh, and then he would, he would linger on as long as he could, and then boom. And the editorial was the same, same thing. He would edit the film and edit the film until somebody took it out of his hands, and then they'd finish the film. And he wouldn't stop editing until he got another film to do. If he got another film to do, then he would stop. He would finish it off, and he would put it together, and he'd boom, be on to the next one. He loved to have something to do. He was always afraid. I don't know whether it's true or not, but it seemed to me that he was always afraid that uh, if he didn't start something, if he didn't have something to do, if he didn't have that, his mind placed in some creative area, he, he would kind of dissipate, and he would, he, would, he would lose it in life. And his life was really making movies. Uh, he did uh, it, coping with life on another. He was he was always very polite. He always answered uh, letters. He would uh, be very responsive to people and uh, uh, things like that. But producers, he hated producers. Producers were the uh, on Major Dundee. He kicked Jerry Bressler off the set. He was the uh, the, the producer of the film, and he wanted to do Jerry Bressler, the idea of the film, and uh, you know, when Sam was making his movie, he was making a movie out of Major Dundee, and uh, it, I, I don't think Sam really realized the power of the producer until uh, we saw the uh, producer's cut of uh, Major Dundee, which had eliminated a great deal of Sam Peckinpah and placed a lot of Chuck Heston and uh, uh, Jerry Bressler's ideas in there, which kind of diminished the quality of it diminished the peck and paw ness of the film. Uh, he had an opportunity later to, to rectify that, but he said, no, nah, I didn't want to do that. But, but Garrett, he did. He did put it together for a television version. I mean, uh, naturally, Pat Garrett was taken out of his hands by <laughs> those people at, uh, at MGM at that time. I don't know who was responsible for it. I mean, there's always been either Jim Aubrey or Melnick or whoever it was. But the editors who cut the film uh, stole a copy for Sam and gave it to him. And uh, somewhere that one still exists. He didn't have a soundtrack, though. He didn't get a soundtrack till he cut the uh, television version, which is in almost, almost perfect shape. Uh, why he does, why, why he did those things, I think, was just to, to maintain that kind of individual characteristic, the, uh, the idea that a, a film must be evolved, not uh, shot based on a script. Uh, he, uh, producers always seem to be uh, wanting, to, wanting him to make their film, and why they hired Sam Peckinpah to make their film is beyond, I mean, it was their mistake, because Peckinpah, a Peckinpah film was more important than a Jerry Bressler film or a Melnick film, or any of those other people's films. And uh, I think will remain so for as long as we have films in the archives. I don't know. I, I don't know what those other demons were, those demons that existed in his personal life while well, they had to do with his marriages and uh, his children and everything, but they, they didn't seem to be... Uh, they seemed to be more of a fantasy. His reality seemed to be making movies, and the rest of it was fantasy. I mean, I feel the same way. I mean, the reality is when you're working, when you're making movies, that's because it is. It's a new reality. Something is being created all the time. Every day there's something new, and you see it, bang, and it has never existed before. A reality. Life becomes a fantasy. You live in the house, and you live in Beverly Hills or Hollywood or Sherman Oaks or wherever it is, Malibu on that. And he had that. That was his, his home was a, a, a trailer on a hill in Malibu with some, hey, I'm going to build a house here when never had enough money to build a house. Never really, I don't think he ever really wanted to build a house there. I don't know that that was a kind of a fantasy that he had, but he, his reality was film. He, there was obviously a side to him in which he covered with the macho behavior, but there was a more feminine sensitive side. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, Sam was an artist. And he was a he was a poet in a in a, a strange way. Well, the way he saw things, the way that he uh, allowed things to evolve, was not 
it was not this money. You got to do it this way, and you got to do it that way. And his his life was not based on that. I think his based his life was based on. Uh, uh, he was a seeker of the truth. He was trying to find out what the truth was, violence and killing and all of that. And he, I, I said, Jesus, Sam. After seeing the first cut of uh, uh, the Wild Bunch, I said. Whew. He says, well, I don't know what it is. I said, well, it, it, uh, you know, all of that slow motion stuff, that really reminded me a lot of Kurosawa. And he said, thank you. Thank you. One time when, when uh, we were working in uh, uh, Yugoslavia, we were shooting uh, uh, Cross of Iron. And we were about, I guess, about six weeks into the shooting, and he was getting a little hinky and a little weird. And, was, and he always liked to spend the weekends in bed and so Katie and I said, well, we've got to get him out of here. Let's get him out of here. I said, well, let's take him to Venice. I've been going over to Venice. We had every other weekend off, so I'd go to Venice and languish my time in Venice. It was perfect, two hours away. So I said, Sam, let's go to Venice. We're going to Venice this weekend. So with a lot of cajoling, we finally got him to Venice. Got him in a wonderful little hotel called uh, Della La Fenice. And uh, it's where all the Roman directors and actors go when they're working on a film or just want to get some inspiration. They go there and they stay. Well, Katie and I were going to take him out. We were going to go to uh, uh, around town, show him Venice a little bit, and do a little shopping by himself. And he said, "No, God damn it, I want to sleep. Uh, get out, go on." I said, "Okay, Sam, we'll just we'll go out and we'll uh, we'll look around for him. We'll find somebody. And after lunch, we'll take him, come back, and pick you up for lunch." Yes, God damn it, get out, God damn it. And so we, uh, we left him up in his room. We went down to the lobby, and here was Fellini. And I'd met Fellini a couple of times in Rome, and I knew him a little bit. I said, ah, well, Federico, how are you, man? And, uh, uh, you know, I said, I'm just Katie. And uh, uh, he said, what are you doing? Oh, well, we're working in uh, Yugoslavia doing a film with Peckinpah, Sam Peckinpah. And he said, oh, Sam Peckinpah, very good director, I believe. And I said, oh, yeah. And he said, listen, it would, he's upstairs right now. Come on, it would really be great if I said, so we could jolt. Felady to get in this little elevator and go up and see Sam. So we knocked on the door and said, Sam, there's somebody here who wants to see you. Katie had the key, opened the door. She said, what do you want? God damn it. And Federico walked around and he said, Fellini. And Sam said, thank you, Mr. Fellini, for giving us all of those wonderful films. Katie and I just about broke up. I mean, thank you, Mr. Fellini, for giving us all of those wonderful films. I mean, it's like a child a child inside of him just kind of, oh, here was this man who appreciated something more than just as macho, you know, his image and everything. I mean, I thought that was really funny, but it was also enlightening. Uh, he, I, we, we, we were in, we were in, a, uh, in Tokyo. Milfuni gave us a party one night in a, in a big hotel. With a, he invited his entire geisha house, which must have cost him a fortune. And uh, in the middle of it, after uh, several cups of, uh, of sake, when all the geisha girls were around telling us all uh, little nasty little stories, titillating and so on, someone said, well, Sam, what are you going to... I said, Sam can write haiku, you know, thinking. <clears throat> and Sam proceeded to write some haiku and totally blew the Japanese away. And Walter Peter, his, uh, you know, his accountant, and myself away, too. I mean, he had, he had a dynamic that was filled with peaks and valleys. I mean, he wasn't an ordinary man, and thank God for that. What do you think his qualities, great qualities as a director, were? His seeking the truth. His, uh, his <clears throat> he would choose things not because of the script, but because of what the script indicated how he might discover as he went along. Major Dundee, he, I said, what is it about Major Dundee that he said, because he continues. Amidst all of the strife, all of the conflict, all of the obstacles, he continues. He goes on. He goes on. Huh. And that was, uh, that's something that you, you don't find in many directors. I mean, I find it, found that in very few directors. I, a lot of directors like to rehearse and get it down pat, you know. So you, there's no, there's, they, everything is very organized. And, well, Sam knew what was supposed to be there. But he went for the extraordinary. He went for something else. And that's, uh, that's what I think was extraordinary about Sam. He didn't go for the ordinary. He found, he tried to find the truth of something. And, 
He allowed it to exist. He allowed that to happen. He, in fact, he created an atmosphere where it couldn't help but happen. And that was, uh, that's extraordinary. I don't know, maybe Kurosawa does that. Can we talk a little bit about Cross of Iron? Cross of Iron, sure. Uh, did you and Sam discuss, because there you played the, the German officer, the, uh, the idea of the film to see it from the other point of view and what the general intentions of the movie were? Well, we did a lot of research, actually. We went to, uh, I guess, uh, well, we were in Castle. We uh, went through the film archives at Castle, looking at all of the German, old German films, the archives of the German, there was a, it's a, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful film archive. If you ever have a chance to go there, we saw, we saw a pristine version of, uh, of The Triumph of Will. It was a long, long film, and uh, we sat through it, and by the end of the film, uh, well, the, <laughs> Lenny Riffensahl is a genius. She was, she made a film out of that thing where by the time Hitler lands, I mean, there's, there's about 20, 28 minutes of Hitler arriving in Nuremberg for the Nuremberg rallies that all, all, the, all the women are looking, everybody's looking up, looking up, and there's this airplane, this old Fokker tri-engine flying and, and up, up, and then there's this kind of a, you never see Hitler until he gets off the plane. Well, by the time he arrives, after 20 minutes of this buildup, it's like God descending down from the, well, we all wanted to stand up and cheer. She was a genius. We saw film footage from uh, uh, all of the battles. Uh, the, what the Germans were, were coming in, they were fighting, you know, and all the, all the real battlefield, battlefield uh, footage. We later went to the uh, film archives in, uh, in Britain and spent some time there looking at, uh, at film. We ran across the same film. I mean, the same thing, the, the, the propaganda films that Germany was producing at the same time as the English. It was like there was a, an independent film company out there shooting films, selling it to both sides because it worked for both sides. It was, it was amazing. And we wanted to find out just what it was, what it was about the Germans. Well, what, what, what Sam wanted to do was to make it about the soldier. It didn't matter whether he was American, he was British, whether he was uh, uh, German, uh, Russian, whatever it was. It was about the common soldier and his feeling about war and his feeling about his, his own uh, understanding of himself and where he was. And that's where we were. That was, uh, we spent, uh, oh, I guess, about a month, month and a half traveling all over Europe, getting this, you know, working on the, on the script, working on possibilities of things, and he got a lot of ideas from that. And the idea of war and the devastation of war, the, uh, the psychological devastation as well as the physical devastation. Uh, but I think the, the, his main idea was to say that the warrior, whether he was a spiritual warrior or a, uh, a, a, an absolute macho guy, was predominant. He wanted, he wanted to show that, uh, that the cross of iron was something that one achieved through his valor, through his understanding of what war was about. It was the overcoming of the obstacle, the enemy. And we have enemies in us just as, uh, you know, like every day we fight our own obstacles, our own enemies within us. And it's the same thing was kind of a metaphor, I think, that he was looking for. At least this is the way that I, 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 I looked at it. And uh, Steiner... The character that I played was uh, the lead character who was, who was not, not an officer, but a, uh, who had been broken from an officer because his, his hatred for the Nazis. To, trying to find out what, what it was about uh, that kind of a soldier was much like uh, an, an American soldier, you know, like a, a, a regular army guy who's uh, fighting a war, maybe the, the, the regular army guy who's fighting a war in Vietnam, who doesn't like the idea of fighting the war in Vietnam, but nevertheless fighting it, fighting it to the best of his ability. And that's what we were doing. That's what we made the film about. That's what it seems to me to be. We had no ending. We didn't know what the ending was. They kept making us, they kept sending us endings to shoot. Finally, the last, the last day of shooting, or the, the next to last day of shooting, 
Uh, our producer uh, hadn't purchased enough short ends. He was buying short ends all over Europe in order to find, to have enough film uh, cheaply to make the film all for budget. And uh, we ran out of film the night before we, you know, the night before we were supposed to shoot the ending. So we had to shoot the ending in a half day, and we didn't know what it was. We arrived at this uh, train station. It was all bombed out train station in, in Zagreb with trains burned over, they were all rusted. It, was, uh, it looked like the, the war had happened about 10 years ago, and it was just, just like that. They hadn't moved anything. It was just a war site. Destruction, that train. Uh, Sass Bedigar, special effects man, had been over there working on it, and he had fire and everything. And we didn't know what we were going to shoot. And uh, they said, you've got to shoot this ending. And it was a very corny ending, we're just kind of wrapping everything up. And uh, we were walking down the thing, and he said, Damn it, Coburn, those bastards are taking my film away from me. And, he, and tears started coming down his eyes. And I said, Oh, God, they've made Peck and Paul cry. I said, Don't worry about a thing, Sam. God damn it, we'll take care of it. And I watched him down there, and I said, Get up there, and that. And there was this kind of a, uh, like a, uh, thing on stilts with a platform where you could kind of see out over the thing. I guess it was some kind of a prisoner device to, to watch people walking by. And uh, so uh, at this time I saw Alex Wanitsky and uh, Wolf Hartwig, who was our producer, Alex Wanitsky was the American ex executive producer, came walking down the film, storming down the thing. And I just wore a rage at him. I grabbed Alex Wolniski by this thing and I said, get him out of here. Get that son of a bitch out of here. You know, boom and get out of here. Stop boom. boom. Uh, and I looked back over uh, over my shoulder, and here was Sam on this platform going, <laughs> chuckling under his breath, that son of a bitch. Well, anyway, I got him off the set, and we still didn't know what we were going to shoot. And so he said, well, we set the cameras up, you know, and we put them there, and we didn't know what we were going to do. He says, all right, Sass, light it. We didn't know what we were going to do. And... Uh, so he lit it, and this whole thing went up in flames. My God, it was a, you know, like an inferno. And he brought Max, Max Shell, and myself. He said, "Okay, just running through there, run through." Okay, we're running through there, and he's "Okay, they're shooting at you, bloom, bloom, bloom." And Max goes like that, and his gun falls apart in, in the middle of the scene. That the gun falls. And he said, "Oh," I said, I said, "Oh," and I started laughing at it because it was. I thought it was all over, you know. And he says, "That's it. That's that's the ending of it," and that's what we shot. We shot that ending. Now that's that's what happened. That's how that ending came about. What do you miss about? I miss his presence. I miss that enigmatic nature. I miss all of the things that he he pushed me he pushed me over the edge. Sam was the guy who would push you over the edge of the abyss and nine times out of ten jump in after you. Sometimes he wouldn't. <laughs> nah, he was extraordinary. And if he was back here now. And you could just have a word to him. What if I had a word with him? Well, we probably wouldn't talk about anything very special. We'd probably have a few tequilas or something like that in the bar, and we'd just rap about, I right, remember that? Yeah, I remember that. Well, what are you going to do now? I don't know. They're trying to get me to do this or that or something else. And I'm reading this, and I've got a story. I've got this thing that I the. What was the name of that thing? The Outlanders or the, uh, what was the name of that? That Probably. thing. The what? The castaways. He always wanted to do the castaways. I wish, uh, I wish, uh... And he'd sometimes call you towards the end of his life, wouldn't he, at strange times? Well, yeah, we'd call him every... <laughs> when, he went, when he was totally alone, he, would have, he was finishing up Convoy, which was a, a disaster to begin with. It was, it was based on a, a song, and it was a terrible song to begin with. I told him, Sam, you can't make a movie out of this. It's about guys on, on radio, I mean, on a CD, talking back and forth. I mean, what, how are you going to do that? Said, Don't worry about it. I got it. And it was another one of those things that he got the job before he finished editing, so they'd finish editing so he could get another job. And he started preparing this silly movie. It was terrible. So it was, uh, he was really in and He had to finish shooting. There was a, 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 a scene where... Uh, a rubber duck dies, or is supposed to die, and he drives off this bridge and everything. 
And by this time, he'd alienated everybody. I mean, Bobby Vesiglia, Katie, he'd fired because she was, uh, she, he said, he, she stole his script. <laughs> and Katie was probably the most loyal, the law, his loyal associate for as many years as, uh, as I recall. And, uh, but at the end, he, he alienated just about everybody. Strange, I don't know why that was. I mean, it was uh, part of his nature to uh, put everybody up to it. I mean, he tested us all. We kept coming back for more. We... But as Casey said, he, he never really tested me. Well, he tested me in, in, in strange ways, but he was never mean. He was mean to a lot of people. So he had that dark side to him. He had a very dark side that a lot of people really resented and really hated and really called, uh, you know, was fearful. But Maybe it was that dark side, there was this, there was many facets of uh, a human being like Sam Peckinpah that make you, make you want more of it. Because there, there, it, it, there's the, 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 the facet of his ability to be a, a, a master filmmaker or his ability to write haiku and to really solidify an idea in haiku.